This podcast is a proud member of the Unidentified Network. On the Track is a monthly web TV show about cryptozoology, natural history, green issues, and whatever else the team feel like making up as they go along. Enjoy. So, what have we got exciting that's coming up in this episode, Mr. John? Well, Hannes, in this week's exciting episode, it's the first of a two-part show, interviewing Richard Freeman about his highly peculiar new book, which is called The Highest Strangeness. And believe me, that title almost doesn't do it justice. I really like the old credits. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name's John Dams, and welcome to another episode of... What's that over there? Oh, we've got a special guest in the studio again! All the way from Japan, it's Miss Yoni Egg. This week, I am going to pay tribute to the Exploited and their song, Exploited by Army. Exploited by me army, don't be mess. <laughs> Absolutely beautiful. Thank you, my dear, for gracing our humble studio with your illustrious presence. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to another episode of On the Track. My name's John Downs, and I'm the director of the Centre for Fortean Zoology, and twice a week we bring you a show which is a mixture, a melange, a... um. Medley, a... Laura, what something begins with N? Mamma Mia! I can work with that, Lauren, thank you. It's a Mamma Mia of hard science, weird shit, and surreality. What's surreality? Well, if you don't know, I think you'd better go and ask her. There's no such thing as surreality. Well, ladies and gentlemen, you'll probably have noticed that we're hopping between sets. That's because I'm in the process of sorting the sitting room out, rearranging it, and as you can see here, it's a bloody awful mess at the moment. But enough of our messing about, enough of our jollity and frivolity, and other things beginning with ology. I want you to go over and hear all about Richard Freeman's new book. So Richard, tell me all about your new book. My new book is called The Highest Strangeness and it's about very, very, very high strangeness for tea and Cassidy. Now you might think Fortiana's strange as it is, and yes, 
if you saw a sea serpent or a UFO or a ghost, it would be a strange event. But there are some Fortean cases that are just so whacked out, so bizarre, so surreal, that you can't imagine anybody making them up. If you were going to make up a hoax about something, you'd want to make it fairly believable to take other people in. But these stories are just so deeply strange. You think, what the hell has been going on? And it was an immense amount of fun to write. And as a chap there are chapters on monsters, ghosts, UFOs, and then a miscellaneous one. Excuse me. Monsters, monsters, guests, and UFOs, and a miscellaneous one. So um, I couldn't include everything in it because uh, you'd end up with something like um, Richard Corliss's taste book series with a multi-volume set. So <clears throat> I could only cover a certain amount of subjects. And the other thing is I, I was not trying to make a unified field theory of 40 iron because I don't think there is one. I think it has um, multiple causes. What I was trying to do is record some of the strangest cases and then have a stab at trying to work out what might be behind some of them. And it's, I haven't had as much fun writing a book since I did the great yokai encyclopedia. And it's the first time I've written at any length about ghosts or UFOs. So I've written reams and reams about monsters, but I've never really written about ghosts or UFOs to any extent. Tell me a couple of the um, stories therein. Blimey. Um, one of my favourite... easier. What's your favourite story? Oh, I couldn't choose. They're, they're all so bizarre. Um, a, one of my, one of my favourites uh, is mainly because it's got one of my heroes in John Pertwee, who was the greatest Doctor Who of them all. And uh, when he was a boy, which would have made it in the 19, sometime in the 1920s. He used to go and stop with a school friend. And this school friend's family were very well to do. And they had a uh, Elizabethan, they lived in an Elizabethan mansion in, I believe it was Sussex. And he described the mansion well, and it, it got like a minstrel gallery and they lived in a certain wing of it, and it, he would go and they were all great musicians. And he said he was jealous that he could never be as good a musician because everybody in that family could play uh, musical instruments wonderfully. But he used to go and stay, and they put him up in this room. But one time they had other guests, and they had to put him in a different room in a different part of the mansion. And he overheard his friend's mother and father talking, and the father was saying, well, are you sure we should put him in that room? Is he going to be all right? And the mother said, oh, he's a, he's a heavy sleeper. It, it, nothing will bother him. And he wondered what they were talking about. So he goes to stay in the room, wakes up in the middle of the night, and there's a vile smell that he compares to a rotting sheep carcass. And he, he throws up. So he's mortified that he's thrown upon a sheep. So he goes and washes them and hangs them up on the boiler so they'll be dry in the morning. And over breakfast, they asked him if he'd had a good night's sleep. He said, oh, yes, I slept wonderfully, not wanting to admit he'd been sick. And then the, uh, the mother said to the father, well, I told you it would be all right. And he was thinking, well, what are they talking about? What's going on? The next night, he wakes up again in the middle of the night with this foul smell again. And then he sees what's causing it. And he said, there was this thing that looked like a green glowing tree stump that was crawling very slowly towards his bed on its roots and from the side of it from the bark there appeared bubbles coming out of the bark but they didn't burst they just vanished and this thing reeked of rotting flesh and he completely freaked out and ran out of the room in hysterics and uh, his friend's father berated his mother for putting him in the room and uh, 
subsequently that part of the mansion was locked up and never used again. And I've been trying to work out which mansion it is. And I've looked online and I've asked um, local historic societies and I can't work out where it is. Now, so one account says it's in um, Suffolk and another one says it's in um, uh, one says it's in Suffolk and one says it's in not Surrey. Um, Sussex. Sussex. Sussex and Suffolk. So it's one of the two, but I haven't been able to work out what what mansion it actually is. Well, if I can give you a little bit of advice, first thing that comes to mind is if this guy who was a friend of his, who was an old school friend, find out which school John Perky went to and have a word with the Old Boys Association. You know, I'd never thought of that. Yeah, I, 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 I have to do that. If I can find out what school he was at. Which you can probably do from who's who or something. Because I would have thought... Yes, John... I, I, know the, I know the family name. It was something like Peters or Peterson, something like that. And I did track down a house where a family lived with a child of that age, but the house wasn't anything like old enough to have been um, the house in question, unless John Pert was misremembering. It was a Victorian house. Are there any other stories of haunted trees? Because that's... Yeah, um, yeah Elliot O'Donnell wrote a whole book about haunted trees. There's one where there was um, a shadow of a tree where there was no tree in this garden. A big shadow of a big tree where there was no tree. Uh, there's another one that was supposed to kill anybody that slept underneath it. And that was in some London park and tramps wouldn't sleep anywhere near it. And then for, there's the whole tradition of ghost trees in Japan. There's a tree called... Um, if I remember correctly, it's called Jibuko. It grows on battlefields, and it instead of feeding on water, it feeds on blood, and it's supposed to sprout on battlefields. Well, Japan has the weirdest and most completely out there um, monsters of all, doesn't it? It does. That's why I wrote a book about it, The Great Yokai Encyclopedia. Available so, from all good bookshops and most crap ones as well. And all the good bookshops all have ample parking, boys and girls. But apart from that, or you can get it from the CFZ website, from our own bookshop, from the lovely Miss Palmer. She will be your guide and philosopher as you peruse all our wonderful books, including this new one of Richard's and the one he's talking about, the Yokai Encyclopedia, but back to not being the acceptable face of capitalism. Is the weird hippopotamus fellow that was part of the Tokolosh myth? Oh, no, no, that's not... So the Tokolosh is a different thing. Tokolosh is bizarre enough, isn't it? But, no, 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 but they, no. Is it in the book? Oh yes, yes, the big the big gay rapist hippo man. Yes, yeah, there's a, a case. A, a South African lawyer writes about it, and there was a case where uh, a man was found beaten to death with a spice mallet that was used for smashing up the spice. And his son was. I think this was in South Africa, and his son was away in Botswana or somewhere. Um, on family business. When he came back, he said, yes, it was me. I killed him. And when they asked why, he said, well, I woke up one night to find myself being um, raped by an old man who had the head of a hippopotamus. And he would he would come and do it every night. And then I was like paralyzed. And then one night I managed to move a bit and got this hammer and beat him around the head with it and killed him. And it was my own father who, who was transforming himself into this demonic creature with the, the body of a uh, an old man and the head of a hippopotamus paralyzing him and then coming and bumming him and um, he was acquitted of murder because the, the jury decided that they wouldn't like to get bummed off a big gay rapist hippo man either when on earth did this happen 
Oh, this was relatively recently. It was, I think, it was the 1990s. There's nothing. It wasn't, nothing. It wasn't a long time ago. Then we have the, the to say, is there? No, uh, there's the Irish water rhino, which attacked Alphonsus Mullaney and his son Alphonsus Mullaney Jr. They'd gone fishing in a in a lock in Ireland and felt something tugging on their their line. And when it emerged, it it looked like a a web footed rhino that charged at them, and they ran away. But wouldn't you? Yeah. Then there's the, uh, the the giant ghost crab in South Africa in the 1890s of a poltergeist case where a young girl was having her long hair tied to an old fashioned bedstead, you know, the old brass. Bedstead. And <clears throat> in order to find out what was going on, the father invited a bunch of his friends round to watch the girl as she slept. Can you imagine that happening today? A dad oh, God, <laughs> That sounds horribly Jimmy Savile, doesn't it? Yeah. But she'd call out and they'd see her hair being pulled by something invisible. And another time, it, it started to coil around the, the bedstead. And when they intervened, it stopped. And eventually, this apparition emerged, appeared, and it was a giant, glowing, ghostly crab that floated around, bumping into things. If you're going to make a ghost story up... Where in the equation do you think, I know, I'll make the ghost a giant floating crab. Does it tax little girls? Oh, goodness gracious. By the way, backpedaling a bit, have there ever been any other accounts of giant aquatic rhinos in Ireland? Well, One apparently that there, were, there were more from the same lock prior to that, but I've never been able to track them down. What was the source for the rhino story? I originally saw that in the part work, um, The Unexplained. But it's turned up in, in others, other things as well, other books as well. Golly. But then there's a whole sort of weird varieties of things that are hard to categorise that I've never heard of before, like the flats. Dermot McManus, who wrote um, that book on fairies, what's it called? The Middle Kingdom, Kingdom. and Between Two Worlds, he, he gave them the name The Flats. And they are flat, hairy, pancake like things that crawl along the floor. And, um, and there's, there's a couple of uh, examples from Ireland. There was one about a, a chap who was staying with relatives, and in the middle of the night, he gets out of bed to use the toilet and treads on this flat, hairy thing that screams like a, a person and slithers off. Another one that attacked his own aunt that slithered in through the window, and she seemed to be paralyzed while this flat, hairy thing crawled on her. And, and she prayed for it to go away, and eventually, slithered off and slithered out of the window again. And then there's one totally unconnected with Dermot McManus from, I believe it's from the late 70s, early 80s, at a place called the Charter House, which is in Somerset. Uh, it's this big old building you can um, rent out. I've actually looked into renting it, but it's, it's terribly expensive. But the guy that uh, used to be the caretaker there, because it's used for storing uh, search and rescue equipment as well. And he used to go in and um, make sure all the equipment was in working order. And then he'd stay overnight in the dormitories. And one night he heard something scratching around outside and he thinks it's a fox or a badger. And then apparently somehow it's got into the kitchen and he knows all the windows and doors have been locked. And it's, well, he's wondering how it's found its way in. And it's clattering around the kitchen. And then he hears it coming up the stairs. And he's scratching at the, at the, at the door. And there's only a very, very narrow uh, opening at, between the floor and, and the bottom of the door. And it's less than an inch. But this thing somehow slithers under it and attacks him and bites into his leg. And it's biting and scratching at his leg. And it's like a flat pancake 
like thing covered in hair and he kicks it off and it flees back the way it came and he hears it going under the door down the stairs out under the kitchen door and away into the night and nobody knows what the hell they are or where they come from how thick are they they're pal- like pancakes completely flat yes yeah. and I'm ra- the, rounded the- and hairy there was a creature in one of um, Robert Heinlein's juvenile science fiction books called the Martian's Flat Cat, which is supposed to be about that thick. And Star Trek stole it for their triples. But it's basically a, Marsh, a science fiction story by Robert Heinlein from the late 50s. And I was, that's the, as soon as you talk about the flats, that's the first thing that came to mind. If you want to support us and help us make more content like these, please press like, subscribe, follow our Facebook page and check out our Patreon. And there's the ghost of Joe Strama, who's an ever more regular visitor to my little studio, says... Don't forget to ring the notification bell, otherwise you'll miss the new episodes. And that would be an awful pity, wouldn't it? They might be thinking about visiting the South. Well, there's things you need to know. The South might seem quaint, but remember, in the South, they drink shandy. They keep cats. They vote Tory. They go to focus groups. They go to wine bars. They're as soft as shite. So if you visit the South, remember, think once, think twice, think soft as shite. That was a public information film. Well, ladies and gentlemen, that's the end of another episode. I hope you enjoyed it. I want to say a big thank you to Richard Freeman, who is my guest this week. And I want to say a big thank you to my producer, Louie, who is still wandering around the colonies wearing a Donald Trump wig and doing his best to hold a rally. I'm not sure he's going to be doing at the rally, but he might be in be sharing, selling shares in the latest CFZ website or something. And I want to say a big thank you to V. McCrinnan and Richard Freeman, but for whom I wouldn't be able to do all the stuff in the show. And I want to say a big thank you to Graham Inglis and Gr- Gwyneth Palmer, who, but for whom I wouldn't be able to do all the stuff I do in the CFZ. I'm going to be back on Saturday. What am I going to be doing on Saturday? Well, we've got the second part of this episode where we continue to talk about Richard's monumentally peculiar new book. And I hope you all watch it and I hope you all enjoy it. So, are you there, Mr. McCrennan? Because if you're there, I have a question for you. Are you going to be watching the show this weekend? Mr. McQuillan, this following Saturday, Mr. McQuillan, because if you're there watching it, Mr. McQuillan, and I'm there doing the live chat and the notifications and all the other stuff, quite a lot of which I managed to screw up last week, so I do apologise. I'm going to be seeing you. <laughs>